Uh, joining me now, it's my pleasure to introduce John McDonald, a shadow a chancellor, uh, and at a very interesting time in our country's history. If I could start first of all by taking your mind all the way back to the weeks leading up to the referendum of 2016, mm. did you ever imagine we would be in the fix we are today? No, not in not until maybe the last week. Up until then, I was still confident. As I think most people were who campaigned for Remain. I was still confident that we'd win. I then I thought it'd be tight, but I still thought thought we'd win. And I was predicting, I was predicting something like fifty five, forty five, that sort of thing. Um, and then in that last week, I'd been doing meetings in northern towns in particular. I was up in different places in that last week I thought this has gone away from us definitely gone away from us and I thought I still thought we might just I thought it'd be tight but I still thought we'd win but then it was just you could palpably you could feel the vote was gone even allowing for that the the not seeing the result I mean and we haven't even experienced the full consequences yet but did you imagine when the result came in we would be where we are today no 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 I thought I thought whatever the result, we'd manage it. I thought well, somehow we'd, we'd rise to the occasion in terms of, if it was a remain, I thought, well, we'd have a process where we brought people back together again. Uh, I knew that would be difficult though, because in the meetings that I've done up north in particular, outside of the city areas, um, it was almost like a by-election where everyone's grievance went into one vote and people were pretty angry in those towns and, and areas. So I thought it'd be difficult bringing people back together again, but I still thought we'd do it. Then I thought, well, if it goes the other way, once we knew the result, I thought, well, actually, we have a managed process now. We'll have to manage it effectively. And I thought then, we'd, I thought the government, even this government, I thought would be able to manage, negotiate and a deal. And that clearly proved not to be the case. So where does that leave Labour MPs today with a meaningful vote looming? Still talk of yeah. a rebellion within your own ranks. Uh, there's well, likely to be a rebellion in the Tory ranks. No one seems to be able to call it. I've heard from 200 MPs <laughs> could vote the deal down to Andrea Leadsom saying back the deal. I can talk about the two camps, if you like. In terms of um, the Labour Party now, uh, I've been talking to all sides, all the different views. I've been meeting with different Labour MPs to talk it through what their feelings are. There were four or five, no, there were five uh, Labour MPs who voted with the Conservatives before in support of Brexit in some form. Um, in talking to them now, that's not the case because they don't support this proposal the government's brought forward. There's another group, again, who were concerned about, um, they came from Leave constituencies like I did. My constituency voted Leave, which was a bit of a shock to me as well. Um, a number of them thinking, well, we've got to vote for some form of deal. But I'm talking to them, they say, you couldn't vote for this deal. It's so bad. And there's a large number on our side, obviously, who, who remain as, um, well, re as Remainers. Looking then at um, looking at then the SNP, solidly against the government's deal. We've met with Nicola Sturgeon a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's quite clear that she's not yeah. going to allow other MPs to vote for it. Um, the gr Liberals the same. Caroline Lucas, the Green, expressed their strong so it's dead, dead it. in the water. The well, it, it depends on the DUP and so far what the DUP is saying, they're not going to support it. And I think they might hold to that, you can never tell. On the Conservative side, just doing the assessment on the numbers, I think some of the numbers are, uh, against the deal, I think, might have been exaggerated a bit, but they're pretty pretty high. And Although if, Andrea led some. I mean, some people might say that if you could persuade her maybe, to say back maybe, the deal, then yeah. who else might follow? Maybe, but I sat in the chamber on both statements when the Prime Minister spoke. And if you remember, on the first statement, it was an hour before a single Conservative MP got to support her. Then on the second, it was about 50 minutes as well. And the strength of feeling amongst people you wouldn't expect from, former cabinet ministers like Michael Fallon and others, it was quite strong. So I'm not sure whether she's, uh, even in this last couple of weeks, she's capable of turning that round. Okay. Uh, Labour rebels, are you saying there are no Labour rebels then? I think we'll hold them together. I genuinely do. Yes, I do. Okay. If the deal is voted down... Yeah. What can people expect to happen then? Well, first thing, if it is voted down, it'll depend on the s scale. Would, of would, the your, would you advocate your MPs talking to government whips? We've been doing, and, well, we've, so, we've, been, we've, been talk, we've been trying to talk to this government all the way along. If you remember, Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party conference set out if the deal protects jobs from the economy and set out a number of ways. He said we'd support it, but that isn't what's going to happen on this deal. It won't. If it's voted down, our view, you know, that's the will of Parliament. I can't see um, 
a deal being somehow conjured up on the basis of the existing one that will get parliamentary support. Our view is we should have a general election. What might happen is that the deal is voted down and then the Prime Minister goes off to the summit because there's a European summit soon afterwards and tries to renegotiate a bit. I don't know. If she does come back with minor tweaks or something like that, I, don't, I can't see her own side supporting her, let alone us. If some of your MPs were minded to back the deal... Would they be betraying Labour? Or would they be? I mean, the word traitor has been used no, an awful no, lot no, already. No, that, that's not the nature of the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn. Look, people, we respect people's views. But we, at the Labour Party conference, we came together and, and had a really healthy debate. We came to a conclusion. We want the deal that protected jobs and the economy. If we can't and get you, that... And you don't think that's there? You no, don't no, think so. no. Well, look but at no the, deal well, look at the economic, becomes an yeah. option then, oh, doesn't no, it? And I, that could be much worse. Well, I think the one thing I think we're certain of in Parliament at the moment is that there's an overwhelming majority against no deal deal and you saw the economic forecast published this week from first of all the treasury itself so a, a cut yeah. in gdp a, a, a lack of growth in gdp costing us about 40 billion to 150 billion then the bank of england reinforcing yeah. that saying no Project fear seven apparently well i you just have to at least take account even if you're skeptical of them you have to take account some elements of it and it's pretty staggering that it's not just them we had two other independent reports this week saying the same thing if the deal is voted down, mm. no deal could go on the table. It depends perhaps what the Tories decide to do in terms of running the country, isn't it? We could have a I, leadership change yeah. and possibly a new Prime Anything Minister tasked with getting a better deal. Is, that, is the possibility of going back to Brussels for a better deal existent? I think it is, but I don't think, and this is the problem that the Conservative Party have got, and this Conservative government, and it isn't just... Theresa May. It's just not personalised around her. It's about the Conservative government in total. They've proved themselves in two years to be incapable of negotiating an effective deal. One that will be protect jobs in the economy or one that will sustain a majority in Parliament, let alone build a consensus. And the reason for that, and you know, this is a, I know it sounds like a party political point, but it's true. They have spent more time arguing amongst themselves than they have negotiating with our European partners. They created a climate in those negotiations of sort of threatening, banging the table, walking away. And I, I've said from the beginning, look, in my previous job, I was chief executive of a local government association representing London, and I managed European funds for London, and I had an office in Brussels, and I negotiated in Europe on behalf of our capital city. And you, the way you negotiate in Europe is you work on the base of mutual interest and mutual benefit, and if you can do that, you'll get a deal. If you're threatening, banging the table and all the rest, that's not the way you negotiate in those terms. So I think they've proved themselves incapable as a government of negotiating a proper deal. Is the door open? You yourself have said you're, you are open-ish to a second vote. I'm careful of using the word referendum. Yeah. Yeah. We don't. Could you yeah. be more clear on what Labour's yeah. position Let's might go be, it. And, and also what the question should be? Okay, step by step, what we agreed at Labour Party conference, and this is the sovereign body. First of all, we want to we want to deal that protects jobs and economy. If we can't get that, we want a general election. So if that vote goes down, we will be calling for the Prime Minister to convene a general election. In Parliament, it's very but then difficult. Then you could fix term Parliament. Yes, to do exactly. It. Yeah. It's very difficult to secure that. Not impossible. Not impossible, but it's very difficult. Right. We know that. If we're stuck with a position that we can't get a deal that will protect jobs and the economy, if we can't get a general election, our conference decide all options are on the table, and that includes uh, some form of public vote. Of course it does. But have, we'll... have you spoken to Jeremy about it? Because he, he seems very reluctant. Not at all. No, he's, he's, he was the person who actually, as leader of the party, ensured that we had the debate at conference and ensured that compromise, and it was a compromise that went through conference. We're abiding by that. The issue then, uh, and we'll have to judge this at yeah. stage, and it's very difficult to judge in advance. But it's the question, is it? What yeah, do we it put is. on the paper? That will be determined in due course. Should it contain, it would have to contain deal or no deal, but should there be some kind of option for a let's throw the whole thing out, let's forget about it? I've, I've said up until now that, look, the ballot paper will be determined by Parliament. It's difficult to see Parliament deciding, if there is to be a choice, that you don't have at least some remain option on there. But it will be determined by Parliament if, it, if we get to that state. My view, and I, I come back to it time and time again, and this isn't just for party political advantage, it is to a certain extent, but it isn't overall. I'm trying to say... If we had a general election, people would have to debate the issues, but also they'd choose, choose the team but you might, that did the negotiations. The system stuck against you. I think we can both see that. It's weighted against us, yeah. but 
you know, we've seen in politics over this last couple of years, anything can happen. But, so we're prepared for a general election. But this, this second referendum, qu the question, I mean, have you had discussions with, with Jeremy Corbyn about what might appear no, on, on the ticket? No, we're not at that not, stage. Not what, we've, really what we've said, we're not at that stage yet. What we've said is we will concentrate on ensuring, first of all, we have a proper debate about the deal. We've put forward our options on what a real deal should be. And we've said, you know, permanent customs union. Yep. Relationship with the single market, and then uh, a strong relationship with the single market, and then also the protection of employment, it, it's environment, and consumer permanent rights. Permanent customs union, is that leaving the EU? I think it is, actually, but it gives us the opportunity, as well within the customs union agreement that we'll have, to say we want a stronger say about future trade deals as well, because of the scale of our influence in terms of our market, economic market. Very briefly, have you war games strategised how you might make the fixed term parliament act work for you because i'll be honest i <laughs> have and i can't quite figure out how you're going to do it yet it, it will depend i think it will depend on the nature of the first vote that's the first thing it will depend on the reaction from the government about whether they're going to listen to parliament or the not dup yes but also whether they're listening to anyone and up until now i'm afraid they haven't been and you never know in parliament itself when you have a government and a prime minister that has just said I'm not listening to anyone anymore. I'm going to drive this through no matter what. You'd be surprised at the reaction. There might well be a bloody-minded reaction from some MPs and say, well, that's it. Let's go to the people and let them decide. Rory Stewart, I think, has been doing a mm. rather good job for Theresa May on pushing the deal. And his numerous interviews starts by saying, very quickly normally, well, if we count, if, if a second vote is off the table and no deal is off the table, you end up with a deal that's somewhere in the region of what Theresa May has. And, of course, the critical bit in Rory's address is you skip over the second vote quite quickly, but the no-deal scenario, mm. a lot of people think you should back no-deal, that that's what the people have voted for. The no-deal would be catastrophic. Um, we've seen that in all the economic assessments, and whether you're even sceptical about those, even if they're in a broad range, it would still be pretty catastrophic. I can't... I can't see I, I can't see a majority in Parliament supporting a No Deal because of those consequences. I can see there's an overwhelming majority to prevent it. Lot, what, can, lot can you see the DUP walking away and opening the door to a general election that you might win? Anything could happen. I think anything could happen at the moment. So I, I'm talking to John McDonald, Shadow Chancellor, and um, I'm now going to get him to paint us a picture of what life might be like after a general election won by Jeremy Corbyn. You're then uh, you got your hands on the uh, the Treasury keys. Um, you've talked about a lot about renationalisation, um, and a lot of people say, you know, "Can we afford it?" Are you still hell bent on that? We've gone out. It's interesting on the public ownership proposals that we've got. We've gone out and done an awful lot of consultation, and we've said, uh, if you look at the sectors we're looking at, water, rail, Royal Mail, and energy. Um, take water for example. We've done a lot of talking to people about water. And there's been a lot of opinion polling about whether or not people support bringing it back into public ownership. The levels of support between 70 and 80 percent consistently. And I was trying to think, why is that the case? And people just feel ripped off. And I'd just give an example, really. The Financial Times have been running stories on the water for quite a while. Um, you know, the water is privatised debt free. They've loaded themselves with debt now. Do you know they've even been borrowing some of those companies to pay dividends? They've paid out £18 billion worth of money in dividends to shareholders. They've increased charges above the rate of inflation by 40%. So no wonder people feel absolutely ripped off. So what we're saying is, is that actually we're no longer willing to be ripped off anymore. We'll bring it back into public ownership, but we'll manage it in a different way. And we're consulting with people now how that's best managed. Regional water boards, workers themselves on the boards as long as expert management, but also having consumers and local community representatives on there as well. What else were you doing, say, your first 100 days? Okay. Well, uh, the, priority from the, I'll, uh, the priority for me is getting that first budget up. Um, before the last general election, as all opposition parties are allowed to do, you're meeting the civil servants. Because it was a snap general election, we only had a couple of meetings, and the, what happened was you prepare your manifesto and you go in, sit down with the civil servants and say, this is what we want to do. And they start working up how to implement that. And they'll advise you what they think is best, how best it is to be done. And that's what we're doing now. We're not meeting civil servants yet. We've asked Theresa May to, because we think an election might be coming. We should have that facility again. But what we're doing as teams is taking every policy from the old manifesto, seeing how we update that, preparing an implementation manual, my teams are doing the costings and funding sources, and then we're drafting up the legislation as well. So I, before the last election, I had my first budget drafted. 
I met the civil servants and said I want it in by July and the Finance Act in the autumn. And what that concentrated on is obviously the budget is about how you raise the funds to deliver the services that we need. And that's what I was doing. And we laid it out. I published it in a grey book alongside the manifesto. And I I, and I was proud of that. I, I joked about the Tories, you know, only having the only numbers in their manifesto or the page numbers. It's not completely true, but near as damn it as well. And I was proud of that. And what it did, it said, yes, we will increase taxes and this is where we're going to spend it. There are... Well, I've spoken to Labour Party members. Um, I've talked to members, ordinary members of the public. And uh, there is a degree of trepidation about a Jeremy Corbyn, John McDonnell Labour government. You've never been shy of, of your political influences. At a time when our country is so divided, and yeah. I don't think anybody's going to disagree with that, do you think pushing ahead with what you might call a progressive uh, uh, mm. policies, others might call quite hardcore yeah. left-wing policies. Do you think you're going to be able to bring the country together behind programmes of renationalisation yeah. and so on? You say trepidation. I say enthusiasm. There's absolute enthusiasm out there for change. People have had enough. They've had eight years of hard austerity. The, the austerity hasn't worked. We're still in a dire financial situation. Business investment is, a, a, is stagnating. Wages are still below 2010 levels. Public services, you know, our schools are having budget cuts still. Um, we've got the NHS in another winter crisis starting out now because of underfunding. You know, 5,000 people tonight will be sleeping on our streets. That's not that's not right in a civilised society. So, I, what but you I'm might for, be you might be fiscally against the wall because of Brexit, uh, might, just as you come we'll to start. That. So, and Jeremy Corbyn, yeah. I think it was a conference before last, talked his vision in terms of a 25-year plan. And no one in British political history has survived. Uh, even, we have never got to 20 years. Well, what, I've, what, I've, what I've laid out, what we laid out in the last manifesto is for the lifetime of a five-year period of office, and then we'd build upon that in our second period of office. I laid out a budget that would enable us to basically end austerity and then start investing again in our public services and also lifting people out of poverty. I think that's what people want. But we have to be straight with people is that we have to be straight about how we'll raise those funds. And one is, yes, we will increase income tax. We're going to increase income tax on the top 5%. Well, I was going to say, dude, you're looking at the high earners. Yes, that's right. It is the high earners. And what and kind of tax might they anticipate? Well, you're obviously said, not going to want to show your no, hand, no, but if you go no, back to the 70s... We published, it. No, we published it, and we're straight about it. Uh, for those earning above £80,000, we said a 45p rate, and then 125000 a 50p rate, and we published that. Yep. And we said, here are the figures... And, I, and I've been saying to people, you know, some people might not like this, but actually it's interesting. I've been talking to lots of high earners and we've been testing the ideas. And people are saying, I'm willing to pay a little bit more because I don't want to live in the sort of society where I do come outside my office and there's someone sleeping in a shop doorway. And I, and I generally find British people altruistic. We also said, yes, we'd reverse some of the corporation tax cuts. And the reason I'm saying that is because the government has this theory that you cut corporation tax and somehow they start investing. They're sitting on £700 billion pounds worth of income not invested. So I want to use that money to invest. I said that, yes, we will tackle tax evasion and tax avoidance, which is on scandalous levels in this country. Even this government now has acknowledged some of that, but not going far enough. And we said also that we would introduce what we call a financial transaction tax on the City of London. Not a huge amount, a few, you know, £6 billion in the end, we think is maximum. And that will then be ploughed into our education service and to develop free childcare. Now, all of those things... They're hardly revolutionary. They're just good policy making and Taking common sense. A public land and private ownership. I mean, when you saw the headline, I thought, oh my God, oh, what's I John thought, McDonald talking about well, now? I but that actually, was a bit strange as well. Well, it's that the headline sounded like some kind of Marxist yeah, stage one, yeah. but you're actually, reading, you're talking about community yeah. land trusts. Is that you're right reading said? the wrong newspaper. That's I read problem. all the newspapers, John. That's my, that's my problem. Oh, you poor thing. Um, look, I including the Morning Star. Oh, well done. I have to do the whole lot. Well, the community land trust, what we've done is when I've been to, uh, at the moment, every other Saturday, I'm organising town meetings in towns all over the country, talking about what's their local economy like, what are the solutions in their particular area, and what's interesting about it. People are buzzing with ideas. And one of the things that came up in one of our meetings was people were saying, actually, we're losing control of our town because land is build up, being bought up, and actually bought up and then banked, not even built upon or used. And at the same time, the planning system isn't effective to control that. So what we're developing locally is a community land trust. I thought, brilliant idea, where the community starts buying the land and in that way controls it for the long term. Brilliant idea. The headline was quite scary, though. I know, but what, <laughs> what I'm able to do, and this is the form of communication, 
I use live media as much as I can and obviously come on stations like yourself to yeah. get the message across straightforwardly. And you, you give us a fair shout. I accept Thank that. You. But also... We're doing meeting after meeting around the country and we reinvented word of mouth as a form of political communication. Let me um, ruin the party now. <laughs> You're not in number 11. There wasn't a general election. Somehow Theresa May has clung on. Do you admire her tenacity? I think no, many no, people... No, who, sorry, I can't you, do that. I can't do that. I, t I tell you why. I, look, I can't do that if someone is clinging on just as... But she was, believes it's in the best no, interest I'm for the sorry, country. She has a wrong judgment and she hangs on the longer this government hangs on, the more human suffering there will be. But also, even over Brexit, the more damage they'll do. Because she knows is even if she wins the first vote, she then has to bring in the legislation. And then what will happen? Her own side will pick it. It'll be like John Major all over again. But surely you would prefer Theresa May running the country than Jacob Rees-Mogg. Well, I prefer Jeremy Corbyn, and that's the opportunity <laughs> that we've got in the next election.